All right. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are uh, we're basking in the afterglow of, of the uh, vote yesterday. We are. Yes. We are. And I, I mean, I, I saw you did some advocacy. The building was lit up. We uh, did light up a building. It. Were you surprised by the, like the outsized... By the uh, oh, it was illegally? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it and ask permission later. Well, we figured the city of Sydney probably wouldn't shut us down. But right. Uh, yeah, we didn't have a DA to do that. Pretty bad publicity if they... <laughs> <laughs> it would have, well, we actually... Well, yeah, anyway, I probably shouldn't <laughs> say that. It would have gotten better. <laughs> um, were you surprised with like the overwhelming uh, majority yes vote? Uh, I don't know if I was surprised. I would say I was very happy with the outcome that it was not close. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, if it was an electoral victory, it would have been the largest electoral landslide we've ever had in a popular election. So right. that gives a very clear, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think, a very clear mission from the, from the people. So Yeah. Um, I mean, Silicon Valley is having a bit of revolution at the moment, you know, culturally. Uh, the marriage equality thing obviously happened a little bit earlier, but still contentious in many states and things like that. But uh, they're having a bit of a revolution at the moment with regards to working conditions, harassment, you know, basically piss poor working environments for employees and things like that. What advice would you give to somebody like, uh, you know, Dara Koso Shrauhi, who has to refactor Uber's culture? Ooh. Uh, I think he's probably far more qualified to do that <laughs> than I am. Uh, that, that sounds from the outside, from what I've read, a complicated situation to unpick. Um, look, I think you've got to start with core values. You've got to make sure you've got the right people on the bus. Get rid of the wrong people as quickly as you can if they're you know, toxic to the, to the culture or to the environment or to what you're trying to achieve. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, but it's hard to do mm -hmm. um, on a continual basis. Um, I think yeah, we've always said it's a marathon, not a sprint, and too many startups think if you sprint long enough, you can kind of achieve something and you just run out of energy you know, and the whole thing blows up. So I don't know, try to be reasonable sprinting mm -hmm. marathon pace. It seems like there's a there's be, kind of turning the corner into a new appreciation for how early you have to build this stuff in culturally, mm -hmm. like at the DNA level of, of building a startup, because there's so many concerns. You know, you're trying to keep the lights on, so to speak, you know, early on and uh, pump and 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 crank and all of that stuff. Uh, but then you you sort of overlook, hey, maybe we should start thinking about the humans in this early on. How, and like, how was that when you started going from five to ten people to two hundred people, say? Look, I think we did a lot of things correctly by, uh, I wouldn't say by accident, without, without forethought of them. I and mean, we didn't sit down and proactively say, okay, we've got to have a great culture, so therefore we've got to do these things. And those, like, it, it wasn't sort of like a, a plan. Um, you didn't set up a Trello board? We didn't set up a Trello <laughs> board. Uh, they went around for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a long time. Uh, but, I mean, you know... Both of the founders have, a, I think, a strong sense of ethics and values that we've tried to imbue in the business. Um, we always had an early rule that we wanted to build somewhere that we wanted to come to work. I'm um, a pretty lazy dude, and if I didn't want to come to work, I, why would I expect anyone else to come if it's not the type of place that you want to turn up to? Mm -hmm. um, so, so we had a simple set of rules of thumb like that that I think have done us very well. Uh, and then obviously over time, it's gotten a lot more refined. Um, we continue to invest heavily in culture in experience, in the workplace, in everything else. Um, because I think as you scale the challenges, you start to see big numbers. If you were willing to invest, I don't know, pick a number, $5,000 per employee for all sorts of stuff in the early days, and then you get big, you're like, let's make that 3,000 because it's a big number when you multiply it through. Right. I think we've done a good job at not going down that path and continuing to see how important it is. Um, we have a whole separate set of global challenges now, but it, you know, it's, it's what makes it fun. And is like diversity and inclusion, how do you think about that, um, especially as a global organization where those, those goals are the same throughout the organization but have to be approached differently in different locales? Yeah, I mean, you obviously have to be sensitive to the different geographies that you're in and the way that, um, you know, people's perspectives, right? Uh, at the same time, you know, we, we always say that our, our primary goal is to achieve diversity of thought if we can. So the reason you want diversity is to build the best products for the biggest audience, um, to have all of the different viewpoints and experiences and thoughts that come together. Um, and that necessarily usually requires having men and women or younger people and older people and like a variety of, you know, diversity in the business. Um, that can be difficult in certain geographies. We've certainly had um, areas with that. Uh, we have a very, very open culture, which is uh, fantastic, uh, but can, can create 
you know, a lot of open discussion about these things. And sometimes that's difficult, right? Uh, we had a lot of that with the same-sex marriage debate internally as well as externally. Should we be supporting this as a company? Like, is that something that we should do? And from the founder's point of view, it's a definitive yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but internally, there are people who are going to vote always and we um, have to support their right to a personal choice, to having their own vote, um, their own opinion. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of... Um, people who are quite uh, affected by that vote, mm -hmm. right? There was a lot of people at work. It's a tough thing to be um, in the LGBTI community when these discussions are going on. You're seeing people say things in the press and it, that, right. it's, it's, it's so, you know, we wanted to support that group going through a particularly tough time at the same time. So, okay. yeah, we can be we open internally. We have a lot of um, robust discussions. We seek first to understand, as we say, the other person's point of view. Um, and you can have robust discussions with people in different points of opinion without, you know, mm -hmm. name calling and other things. So we try to walk the balance. Yeah, I mean, even on our team, which is much smaller, obviously, but we've seen that, you know, and I, I don't think enough people mention it, that these things do have a personal Im impact on those employees sure. as they're going on. The externalities affect them day to day, their performance and all that. And while you want to be, you know, cautious in the way that you approach it, you also have to be aware of it and feel, make them feel free to express it. Absolutely. And we, you know, um, you know we, we, we believe, I mean, our products, our company, our culture, everything, w working open is such a big thing for us and it has so many ramifications. But one of them, as we say, is, is having an open way of being, right? Being able to bring your true self to work is for us incredibly important in a business and we try to imbue that in our products and all sorts of things as well. But, you know, you don't want to sort of have a home self and then turn it off and turn up with your work self and mm -hmm. then... At work, you have to be a certain way. You're expected not to have emotions or feelings or interests, and that doesn't make sense to me. And right it's now. cognitive load, right? Which like reduces your exactly. And then you have to think about I can't say that or I can say this, and I, you know, and and it all has to be balanced and, and reasonable, obviously. But uh, we we try to you know push that internally very much that that we want people to bring their true selves to work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, building the company over time. So you've been, uh, Elastin's been profitable for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. About tw uh, 12 years, 15? 12 or 15. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, uh, it's, I think 12, 15 is an actual number. I th yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how's that affected the way that you've scaled the company versus um, a venture back firm, for instance? Um, I mean, obviously, it's given us a lot more control of that scaling. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg situation that we've debated a lot of times. It's given us a much more long-term view on the business. Um, we're still young. Um, you know, I turn 38 tomorrow. Scott turns 38 in a month. So, it, you know, in 10 or 20 years, we'll still be doing this. So, so you think, oh, if I'm going to be running this business in 20 years, what do I want it to look like? Can't tell you what products it's going to have, but I can tell you what I want it to feel like, what I want it to be like, what I want it to be like to work there. Um, and then obviously being profitable gives you the control to be able to be patient mm -hmm. with making that happen. Uh, and I think you've seen that in our business is that patience over time uh, mixed with sort of growing ambition has been a, a pretty um, powerful combination. And you've only taken venture a couple of times, right? And do you do that for strategic reasons? Or? Uh, it's complicated. So until the IPO, we'd never taken any institutional capital onto the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. That's the technical way to say it. Oh, okay. So we yeah. did two rounds, um, 60 mil in... 2010 and 100 and 50 or so. and change yeah. in um, 2013, maybe 2014. Um, we started 2014, uh, both of which went to uh, effectively to employees. Okay. Um, uh, so that none of that capital went into the business. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I mean, we went public with uh, 250 mil on the balance sheet before we added another 500 or so. So mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't need the cash. At, at no stage did we need cash from the outside world. And how did going public affect your stride? Like, you know, you're going along, you've, you're profitable. Obviously, two years or so before you go public, you go, uh, I think we're going to do this. And you About start working uh, towards six it. Six years, in fact. Okay. Well, yep. So how did it affect when that moment hit? Now you have a bunch of other bosses, you know, in, the, in shareholders or, or in um, a way, a manner of speaking. How did that affect your stride? Uh, I think the important thing is that it didn't. So our biggest goal with the IPO is that it would not affect the running of the business. Right. And everyone says that. I honestly think we took that a lot more seriously. Like the business was culturally ready. We had been behaving internally as if we were a public company for, I don't know, a couple of years before that. Um, so we wanted it to just be a continuation. We have a large flywheel, high velocity business, you know, many, many tens of thousands of companies. Um, and 
nothing about that business we wanted to change in going public, right? That's what investors were valuing. That's what we wanted to continue to do for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So the way to do that was to run like that beforehand, to run like that afterwards, and to try to not have it um, affect uh, uh, the running of the business in a real serious way, right? So we spent a lot of time making sure that that was the case um, and then explain to people, I think, exactly what we were going to do and have been continuing to, to do that every quarter and um, proving to people that we do what, what we say we're going to do, right? We've always been, as Australians in Atlanta, we've always been kind of underestimated mm -hmm. and that's fine. Yeah, we'll, it's handy, we'll right? Uh, Sneak it's attack. handy, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I guess it can be handy. I'm not sure. I mean, it's just simple... I don't know. This is what we're going to do, and then we go do it, and then we do that again. Right. Um, oh, let's talk about product a little bit. So, um, the idea, the concept of a distributed company, has sort of come under fire recently, um, in some ways. You know, there's just been some uh, some pressures on it to say, hey, uh, you know, everybody's been pushing for distribution in um, workforce. I mean, not just speaking from personal perspective, like. 20% of our editorials in one place in San Francisco, but the rest of the entire sure. team is elsewhere. And so I, I, I live it every day. So I'm just curious whether you think that, like, the, what the company of the future looks like. Is it, is distributed companies the future, or mm. is it, a, you know, more of a concentration? Uh, I, my guess is it's probably more of a hybrid. I don't think there's going to be one way of doing it. I think you can make everything work. Um, we have a series of different models internally, right? We basically have sort of one product in every city. So Sydney, Mountain View, San Francisco, Austin, New York, like have a different product in each city. Um, but we have platform teams that run across the whole thing. We have support running in six different geographies. So, you know, we're quite a distributed company. We have six offices, more than 100, 200 people. So, so you know, there's a lot of centers of scale, I guess is one right. way to say it. But uh, I believe our third or fourth biggest office is actually remote employees. Right, and we now, as an example of the learning, we treat that as an office. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've made our share of mistakes. We've made T-shirts with the Sydney logo and the Golden Gate Bridge and the Austin Town Hall, City Hall, whatever. And and then the remote guys like, hey, what about us? And so now we make a remote T-shirt. Like it's an office, right. it's a place, um, and we treat them as a, you know, a part of the thing. We do a um, a, a weekly town hall, um, which is live streamed around the world, and we go to all over the place, and everything else happens sort of on this big multi-thousand person video call and you know we we shout out to remote employees we used to say hey we're going to go over to manila let's wave at the, the people in the philippines and let's go to um you know let's go to austin and now we go to some remote people and they wave and things mm -hmm. so i think you just got to be aware of the model um you can't have a, a hybrid without being very thoughtful and structured about it so certain products like trello for example have a very clear understanding in that group how that group operates and how that operation interacts with the rest of the company. Mm -hmm. Other products like Jira is largely entirely centralized in Sydney and that has a way of operating. They understand that Trello is largely 50% remote, 50% New York, and that's known. Mm -hmm. And we don't try to kind of mix models and things like this, right? And there's sort of known interaction Like, hey, it's patterns. working for this group, so you should do it too. Yeah, we're not going to go to every product and say everybody's going to be remote. That's not going to work. At the mm -hmm. same time, we don't say remote work's not a thing. Our products obviously massively enable remote work, and we have right. a bunch of companies that do that. Um, we're not, I would say, you know, we're quite pragmatic. We're not dogmatic that there's this way or that way, mm -hmm. but we are thoughtful about whichever way you choose for your team, your group, your unit, whatever it is, how does that work? And do people understand the pros and cons of that, right? There are always investments and pros and cons. So if you look at um, you know, the remote groups we have, we have a couple that are like largely remote, they have to spend money on, they spend less money on offices, right? Because there's less offices, but they mm -hmm. spend money on getting together once or twice a year. When people start, how do you get them to meet their team in person? There's things that you have to do that are different. Mm -hmm. What The worst thing to do is to think you can get remoteness for free right. with no cost, which is, is yeah. not true. Yeah. Um, what do your, your strategy meetings for Stride look like when it comes to competing with products like Slack? Um... That's an interesting question. Uh, um, we believe that, um, you know, uh, uh, it starts with our mission, right? So our mission is to unleash the potential of every team. Um, it's been that way for many years. Communications um, of all kinds is a massive part of how we unleash the potential of teams. Um, we've obviously tried everything. We've used everything. The, the sort of massive shift for us from HipChat to Stride in terms of that was the, a great broadening in focus. So Stride's kind of like group chat, team chat, plus a whole series of collaboration tools built in to enable chat to be an active and action-oriented thing, plus 
um, you know, a world-class video conferencing system built in that we continue to flesh out because, you know, we've seen the pain of moving between all these three things on a constant basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. It hasn't actually gone into GA yet, so I think we, we're, we're very early on that. The yeah. waitlist keeps building and the pressure of that, and we're, we're used to that. How do you handle that pressure? Uh, we f- focus on the customer. I feel like I've got no good answers for you today that you're looking for lightning bolts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, we spend a lot of time talking to customers about what works, what doesn't work. Um, we focus very heavily, always have done on um, actual active usage, on customer satisfaction, on these type of things, and let the, you know, the business side take care of itself kind of over time. Mm-hmm. Um, we're very patient. Um, the worst thing to try to win in, in tech is win a war in a year. That's it's not going to happen. The wars are won in, in decades. So uh, we, have, we have a lot of time. Let's talk about like, personal investment for a while. So uh, you made some personal investments over the years. Um, you have an investment arm now that you work with. Um, how do you think about um, picking and choosing those companies? Um, uh, firstly, I would say my model is probably not one to follow. Uh, uh, I have an just ignore the next investment minutes. committee of one and uh, non-economic capital that is, um, it's kind of like playing with, playing with fine monopoly money. So um, we, I would say we prioritize learning, number one. So we, we tend not to invest in anything where there's not a high learning aspect personally um, and then and driven down through the company, mm-hmm. um, through, through the investment company because, uh, you know, pure ROI based things as well. I mean, we go buy a gas station chain or something and it's, I mean, we're not going to particularly learn much and so that's not going to be interesting. Um, the other thing is we tend to prioritize potential social good or potential improvement of the planet, right, in for-profit businesses. Mm-hmm. So we've looked at a lot of things that like meet B the nexus. Like uh, not, not necessarily even B Corps, but just, um, you know, we're talking outside about controlled environment agriculture, which is a right. big space that I'm, I'm very passionate about at the moment. I think there's a huge amount of disruption coming to agriculture and there are lots of ways of doing agriculture that can be far better for the planet. And if you can find one of those that's better for the planet and a profitable growth business, that is interesting to me now. Um, one without the other is, is not so interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, you know, and there's certain spaces as FinTech, obviously we're heavily invested in energy, we're heavily invested in um, energy is another good example where there's a lot of businesses that are both moving the planet towards a more renewable future and great businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have the luxury to be able to find things at the nexus of both. And what is, what do you have to, um, I mean, what do, you, what do you think the, the differentiating factors or um, separating factors are between entre- Australian entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley or the States? Like if you had to characterize based on your interaction with entrepreneurs and obviously your employees, uh, your co-founder, like what do you think differentiates? Um, Competitive advantage, so to speak. I think certainly the operation with limited resources, right? The great Australian startups, right? I find technology businesses is hard to categorize, right? If you're in agriculture, but you happen to be using tech, is that a tech business? Or mm-hmm. But the great Australian startups, growth companies, whatever you want to call them, um, I think operate with very limited resources. Like we're good at getting all the juice out of whatever we have, right? Because we have right. to be. It's like a natural psyche of being on the far side of the planet with a lot of rocks and not a lot of water and things like this, right? We're quite <laughs> used to trying to work out how to really extract that. And um, that's why we build very scalable businesses, very globally focused businesses, very profitable businesses. If you look across you know, the, the bigger Australian tech companies, you see some commonalities. Um, I, I think we have a good ability now to to fund those businesses, which used to be a challenge, right? There's, there's no shortage of capital here um, for great companies. Um, we generally have to work out how to deal with the US equation. So if you see most um, large and growing Australian companies have some um, foot in, in each camp, right? Mm-hmm. They generally have some in Australia and some in America because you need the, the talent diversity. That's the challenge that we don't have. Right, right. Um, so the uh, the South Australian Power Project is underway. Sure. Deadline December first. Yep. Um, that whole thing, very famously, I don't need to retread it, but it came about because you tweeted Elon Musk about, hey, maybe you could do that, build that battery. That's How right. fast could you build it? That's right. Uh, and now they're building it. it um, yep. So we have a high-speed rail project in California that's yep. been going on for <laughs> like a decade. Right. I was wondering if you might be able to send a few tweets for me. <laughs> We have a high-speed rail project that's been going here, for those that don't know, for about 40 years. Oh, really? Uh, supposedly to build a line from Sydney to Melbourne. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe one day. Yeah. I think we'll probably get... 
I think if you tweet, oh, and maybe I'll retweet it from the TechCrunch account, I think we can get some stuff done. Right, yeah. okay. Uh, all right. Hey, thank you very much. We're out of time. I appreciate That's it. That's all right. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.